Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my, again, my name is Dr. Chris Dolan. I'm a uh, political scientist by training. I did my PhD at the University of South Carolina, but I didn't become, uh, I, I became, I originally became interested in international politics, specifically in international political economy, when I, uh, for the first time in my entire life, when I uh, uh, stepped on a plane, it was when I studied abroad in college and didn't know much about the world. I grew up in a very poor home in, in upstate New York, and I, I lived for quite some time actually in Staten Island here. So I'm a native New Yorker, but uh, I grew up very working class. My parents were very insular, very uh, inward focused. They, they de-emphasized travel. They were Italian immigrants, actually, and uh, well, Sicilian. My father always referred to himself as not Italian, but Sicilian. And, and uh, he would always make comments about uh, uh, those people who lived on, uh, yeah, the, the northerners, they, they went skiing and they had blue eyes. And, uh, and, so, and he disallowed speaking Italian in the house, in, in, in the household. And he, he would always say English only. And uh, part of my upbringing was kind of breaking away from that. And my goal is really to sort of share those similar kind of stories with my students about, about breaking away from those agents of socialization that tend to constrain us. Uh, our, our parents, the media, even our educational institutions, what I'm gonna uh, speak a little bit about today. So, so, so some of what I have to offer is sort of social science-y. I am a political scientist, but uh, I've also uh, traveled around the world. I've been to many different places. I teach a course every May and June at Maastricht University in Maastricht, Netherlands, where I, my, the course I teach is called uh, Understanding Human Rights, Global Human Rights, and I bring a group of students to Den Haag, uh, The Hague, where we attend uh, briefings and hearings, and last year we, we attended a status hearing of um, uh, Basco Natayanga, who, was, who who is currently on trial at the International Criminal Court for um, uh, committing human rights abuses. Uh, in Rwanda and Congo, and it's amazing seeing the eyes of my students who are who who for the most part have not traveled that much, but when they're introduced to the actual to to cultures outside the United States and to real and contending issues that are global in scale, their their eyes open up, and I have more confidence in the future. But um, I grew up. Uh, I, I guess I, I entered my sort of formative years as an undergraduate um, right when the Cold War collapsed. And I started, I, 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 knew, I, I knew I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to study international relations, international politics, but I also wanted to learn Russian. I wanted to be a uh, Russian studies major in college, which I eventually became a Russian studies minor. My, my major is international relations. And when uh, the events of 1989 to 1991 happened, my advisor in college looked at me and said, your career is over now. Because, and and we, we, we sort of laughed, and he was being very, very serious. And, and I thought, well, geez, I'm going to go ahead and continue with my Russian, continue studying uh, international politics. I, I went to Moscow um, and St. Petersburg and did intensive uh, Russian language training. And at the same time, NATO and the European, well, what became the European Union are expanding eastward. And I'm, and I'm thinking, I wonder how Russia is going to respond to this. Is, is, it, is there going to be some kind of backlash or, or, or some type of resistance? Well, I found out, like the U.S. State Department usually does, when it believes it has solved a problem globally, it fires everyone. So the State Department, Fulbright's, all of the programs, most of the programs associated with Russia had either been cut and the Russia experts had been fired. And those, and why study Europe anymore? There's peace in Europe and Russia's our ally at this particular point. And how naive were we as um, the, those in, in, um, in the American foreign policy, I guess, establishment? When NATO and what became the EU are expanding eastward, um, Russia eventually lashed out. And um, my talk dovetails nicely to the previous talk about the role of uh, Russia and how it defines its sovereignty. It defines it beyond its um, immediate territory, which is a redefinition of sovereignty, the notion of a uh, Novorossiya, 
that is Russia has sort of sovereignty over ethnic Russians where, wherever they may may be, and um, President Putin has has articulated that. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about the uh, the influence of soft power in relation to hard power, and I want to bring in a little bit of geopolitics. And my argument is really, and, and I'm going to come back to the United States because I think the United States exercises significant soft power, but in a lot of cases when it comes to higher education does so very badly. Um, while countries do have the ability to exercise soft power with their institutions of higher education, they attract students to come to their campuses, they send their students abroad, um, there, there is an attractive feature to that. Like many other countries, uh, the U.S. attracts many, many international students. Half of my students at my college, which is a very small place, are international students. And they're there for all four years. They live there all four years. Most of them do not return home because of the expense. So they're there the entire experience. And I learn a lot from them. And much of my research that I do is actually drawn from where my students have, have pointed me to in terms of um, um, uh, the, the direction of my research. And I would say that for the most part, Many countries, that is, those who have the means to exercise significant soft power, do so in a way in which the international system is sort of premised on, on nation states. And there are those in political science who argue that the world is kind of mired in anarchy. That is, there's, there's no order to the world. And there are those who define the world in terms of humanity, cooperation, and community. And I wanted to bring in some of those notions. So my concepts of international higher education power are kind of informed by a number of different traditions. But it is very limiting, most of which are from uh, the West. As we've referred to Joseph Nye, um, what he argues is that there are two forms of power. There's obviously hard power, military power, coercive power, that is, and soft power, powers of attraction, powers of seduction, and allure. And um, that, so, so hard power is sort of defined in terms of command and coercion, and soft power is defined mainly in terms of, um, uh, I guess, attraction, um, altering views, values, and culture cultural symbols, and ideology. Now, as it is applied to higher education, which is where I want to focus mainly on, now, if countries lack material resources, they are in a position where they're going to struggle with attracting and persuading other states with their higher education, um, their, their institutes, I'm sorry, institutions of higher education. But to understand the complexity and dynamism of power, we should also highlight the intangible ingredients of power, the sources of which are the result of more global characteristics that defy the uh, traditional notions of the nation state. And I do think and I agree with um, uh, one of the former speakers who uh, w w was so instrumental in the area of, of, of hostage negotiations with his work through the UN, and that is that soft power is really the ability at an individual level to exercise person-to-person -person or people power, uh, as opposed to military power and economic coercion. It's the power to attract. It's the power to exercise a morality, culture, ideals through your educational institutions. Emerging from this is a country's national image how that national image in particular is shaped by public perceptions of that country's power potential, how those, how those perceptions are converted into policy instruments. Uh, Joseph Nye states, and, I, and, he quote, and I, I quote him, seduction is always more effective than coercion, and many value, like democracy, human rights, and individual opportunities are deeply seductive. So education is a power of seduction pulling others in to define to the world what that country is about, but to also learn from others, to learn from other cultures in particular. So soft power is more, is more than just exercising influence over others. It is the ability of a nation state to attract toward your own preferences, but to also learn from others' preferences and ideas. It's the ability to get what you want um, by co-optive means of framing the agenda. Encouraging other citizen, 
other citizens and governments to trust a nation's higher education institutions, culture, economy, even its political system, can enhance goodwill and sympathy with its policy positions and core values, affiliation with its interests, contributions to the global community, and consumption of goods, services, and cultural products. So soft power is a concept that defies institutions, but it also depends on those institutions in order for it to be influential. Higher education. Education is everything. And one of the problems, I think, in the United States with higher education is access. The United States is obviously a very advanced, wealthy country, but it does some things and organizes its system in, systems in ways which sort of defy rational explanation. For example, the United States, um, in comparison to other OECD countries, has a persistent challenge with racism with access, gender inequality, and income inequality. So higher education in the United States is effective, it's strong, if you can access it, if you can pay for it. The burden of, financial, uh, of the financial commitment is becoming more and more shouldered and I would say absorbed by not just individuals, uh, future college students that is, but, but families. And, the persistent cutting of higher education in the United States, and there are other nation states in the West. Uh, the, the Netherlands, for example, has, and uh, the UK uh, have, have, have cut the public contributions that they have made in Canada, that they have made to deferring or eliminating the costs of higher education. Actually, I'm start, but, but it's still on the whole more affordable than it is in the United States. So we can access higher educational institutions in the United States, but only if we can afford them, which reinforces inequality, which is driven by race, which is driven and structured by class, which are real boundaries in the United States, real boundaries. So we can do better in the United States by learning from others. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would argue that all colleges and universities around the world are vehicles for the delivery of power. Higher education should be understood in terms of mutual respect, but also mutual interests based on the relative capabilities of every single country in the world, their colleges and universities, as opposed to a zero-sum game of power. Soft power is not defined in terms of what you have and what I don't have, or what I have and what you don't have. So soft power is defined um, in a very positive direction. There doesn't, there doesn't necessarily have to be a relative cost for when one institution or one country increases their, their soft power. And we have all these sort of social science-y measures to determine and define what soft power is. For example, the reputation of a university, its ability to, track, to attract international students, the size of its endowment. Now, I've seen studies where the, the top 100 reputable institutions around the world, 46 of them are in the United States, 11 are in the UK, 8 are in Canada. However, what that does not include are the more cultural elements, and we miss a lot when we do research on higher education. That is the value that, for example, I learn and my colleagues learn as, in, in, in their role as professors from their students, the immeasurable factors. So, whereas higher education functions in a world of transparency, shared governance, knowledge sharing, and the generation of ideas, power, and other forms of traditional and conventional diplomacy, there are factors that we sort of miss. Scholars and students are members of what we call epistemic communities that defy nation states. For example, when I'm teaching my class, I can pull up all sorts of data and show them uh, uh, defense capabilities around the world, what NATO is doing, um, how many languages are spoken in, in areas of sub-Saharan Africa. But they learn the most when I Skype with my colleagues around the world, and they just hang out with each other through technology. And that is something that I think academics and institutions, which are slow to change, by the way, higher education is a... Institutions of higher education change, but the pace of which, with which they change is glacial. They're sort of centers of innovation and, and new ways of thinking, but they're also institutionally very, very slow because they're afraid of ceding their power to others, and those others are individuals. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when I say epistemic communities, these are communities that defy national boundaries. 
that defy national borders. Colleges and universities intellectually shape, socialize, and develop students as global citizens at critical junctures by exposing, by exposing them to academic disciplines that remain with them to varying degrees throughout the course of their lives. So yes, education is about training to get a job. We understand that, but it's also lifelong learning, global citizenship. We want our students, no matter where they are around the world, to contribute to their communities, to go out to travel the world and bring the, and bring the best ideas about the world back to their homes, back to their communities. Yes, to do well, but to also learn and to improve. So the goal of a scholar, the goal of the student is to continue to search, to continue to strive, to continue to push oneself. And when that ends, the learning ends. So these are engagements that include and or should include partnerships around the world in which faculty and students are attracted to one another's ideas, who engage in rigorous research and develop collaborative and innovative approaches to teaching and learning. Soft power, in the end, when it's defined in terms of higher education, does not discount the notion that governments are power-seeking global actors. No one's saying that they're not. We should assume that they are. If there's one thing I've learned in political science, it's the sort of standard, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with, the sort of realist tradition in international relations, which is states seek power. They don't look at the world and see friendships. They see interests. And I've, ta and I've spoken with many in the, in the U.S. State Department, in, at the Pentagon. When they look at the world, they don't see people. They see interests. And I don't think that that is any different than the people I speak to in the U.K. or in the Netherlands, or Germany, or South Africa. What, dif what, what differentiates power is, is, I guess, in terms of the hard power, how many guns, missiles, and weapons, um, and technology, and cyber defense that countries have. But those matter nothing in the area of, I of ideas and cultural exchange. Those epistemic communities of people who defy the weapons, who defy boundaries. Now. Yes, governments are principal actors in the global system, but soft power helps determine which of these actors are the most powerful and influential in shaping the course of international relations and in determining national preferences. Colleges and, in, colleges and universities, like every other global institution, every other non-governmental organization or glo a global corporation are viewed as having significant influence. Now, I, I want to leave some time for Q&A here. So in, in terms of exercising influence, higher education is effective when it successfully attracts students with high quality academic resources and scholarly research. But again, we should note that measuring the extent of soft power within the context of higher education are among, is, is among excuse me, the most important and powerful foreign policy tools that any nation state has. So that's where I'd like to end it. So thank you. And I did have a PowerPoint with a ton of data that I was going to share with you, but I tossed it at the last minute. So <laughs> <laughs> I do have data to back it up, but I didn't want to bore you. <laughs> Questions or comments? Yes. Please introduce yourself. Turn the microphone on. Sure. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm Arab American. I spent the last couple years in Jordan teaching women's self-defense in a center called She Fighter. Um, I'm originally from New York, so that kind of, I got that connection with you. I'm also from upstate New York. Um, I also came from a family where my parents were a bit constraining on uh, what I should be doing. Um, I think um, your points are really important related to how education, not only higher education, but I think any education um, can really, you know, make change and, and uh, you know, affect people or especially students or younger people who aren't previously exposed to these ideas. Um, I think there is also, I would say, a responsibility on the student to reflect on what they're being, being taught. Um, because I think uh, universities and you know other institutes of education um, 
you know, it's not right, but sometimes they, they kind of push their ideas on the students, and it's not necessarily always a, a good thing. Um, I just think that regardless of what we're being taught in the colleges or in the schools, like, it's also important for students to um, reflect on it themselves and just, you know, kind of um, not, not, maybe it's not always good to say that, you know, higher education is the vehicle for change. Like, the students themselves, it's like going back to the idea of being at an individual level. So um, just to reinforce that, I, th I think that, you know, I wouldn't take for granted that what I'm learning in college is necessarily going to open my mind or expose me to other ideas. It might be it's exposing me to wrong ideas as well. So, yeah. And, uh, I'm, when I teach my human rights course in, in Maastricht, I... I'm, I'm always amazed at the what, what I would consider to be, at least academically and in terms of research, the, the higher caliber students who are Dutch as opposed to the American students who I bring over. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Dutch, and, and I'm speaking in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I am re reinforcing stereotypes, but having lived there, um, Dutch children go to school much earlier than American uh, children do. And the Dutch government finances elementary education much more than American school districts do. So they learn more and they learn more early. So by the time they go to college, they're, I think, on the whole, stronger writers, more capable and more confident in the classroom. So I would actually agree, I would agree with you and say that the most significant form of education defined formally and institutionally is actually not higher education. It's pre-primary and primary education because that filters into, into everything else. I think one of the areas that the United States does poorly in when it comes to organizing its educational system is that it pours all of its money into higher education after and, and underfunds its elementary, secondary, and pre-primary and primary level education, making higher education so much more expensive because we got to get the students' skills up to speed because they're not getting it at the earlier, or, yeah, at, at the earlier levels. So we, we underfund primary but overfund higher education, all the while making it very difficult and inaccessible to those who do not have means or those who are left out of the system. So I would argue that higher education works, it's liberating, however, it starts much earlier than 16, 17, or 18 years old. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to ask about the situation in the United States regarding subject areas because um, that, I think that's critical for something like cultural diplomacy where, whereby my own experience in the UK has been that there's been a retraction from social science and arts-based subjects mm -hmm. which are very much under threat. So a discipline, for instance, like anthropology or sociology are mm -hmm. critical for this, yet governments aren't necessarily seeing, I think, maybe the benefits that those subject areas bring. Mm -hmm. um, I know a number of departments in the UK which have actually closed those kinds of subject areas. Mm -hmm. And I was just interested, is that the same here in the States as well? I, I, th I think so. I've, just from having traveled everywhere, and I have two young children who are in, who are in American public schools in, in the state of Pennsylvania, there are, whenever we, bring our whenever we bring our children to an event after school that's academic oriented, it's all science, technology, engineering, and math. And we're creating a generation of students and it starts that young who don't know their own history, are not exposed to another language or culture. All after school programs and field trips are being cut that uh, would bring students to New York, Washington DC, Philadelphia. I mean, just to learn the basics of US history, let alone global history or, glo or, or <coughs> cultures outside the United States. And then when, but, but, but at the same time, we ask ourselves, well, why don't many of our students know American history? Well, look at, what, look at the educational systems that we're designing. So I think one of the things, again, that we've done, we, we've gotten awfully wrong in the United States is we've gone to this extreme of STEM education, which I think is so problematic because it diffuses our humanity, our, our intellectual interest in learning about 
cultures and ideas that are not your own. Because someday, and an American student might not leave the United States. What, what was the statistic? 70, only 70% 70 of Americans don't have a passport. Uh, someday they're going to be working for a boss or have a neighbor who is not like them, who's not the same color, uh, who who may not be of their sexual orientation, and they're not going to be able to know how to interact with that person. So, and that reduces the value of community. So I think education in the United States has followed that, that extreme trend. When I, when I, when I was in um, China, uh, in Beijing, I was, I was speaking to some of the students after a lecture, and what I, I, I asked them about STEM education in China, and how the United States is moving in this direction. And what they said to me was, that is an awful decision on your part. It has done damage in China. We don't even know our own culture. We have an inability to question. Um, it's reinforced an acceptance of, um, of political authoritarianism. So, and as, and as we see, when we do not embrace our global humanity, we get people like a Donald Trump, or we get, Who's, who's, a, who's part of a wave in the West of, of anti-immigrant, anti-other, pro-othering type of narrative? We saw what just happened in Austria, right? In uh, the, the government in Austria, it was a far-right wing leader almost became, I mean, the, the leader of the country. Just by, and, and I'm telling you, the 2016 election in the United States is going to be close. It's going to be close, very, very close, closer than you think. I'm sorry? In France as well, with Le Pen, Pagida in Germany. Uh, it, 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 Donald Trump is not alone. He's, he's not an isolated incident. It's part of a trend in the West. And until we sort of question the narratives, and I, I, I see these narratives are, are, become, are, are being normed. Now, they're entering into mainstream discourse. I do not want to see my children and my college students looking at this and seeing this and hearing this and absorbing this and thinking it's appropriate because it's not. Uh, yes. I'm Mrs. Deborah Salau. I'm a retired permanent secretary a political scientist and a strategist. Uh, I, you are talking about higher education. I see a scenario in most of the African countries whereby we are interested in having our children to come over here and have that higher education. By the time they get back to their communities, to their states, they are always having problem because of this cultural shock. The way it is over here, it's not the same at home. What do you feel about American children? Because I know Americans, my perception, they're very protective, they're concerned about their people. Will you want to expose your own children to go to African countries, and how many of them are there, to live with our people? so that they can have a new orientation about the way we think, about the way we see things. Because our people come here and, and see how you do things, but we try to give them the fundamentals. Most of them, they come at very young age to do the first degree, but some of them come to do their higher second degree and so. Mm -hmm. So don't you think for us to be able to have a very good understanding of the whole world and the cultural you know, the, uh, ways of doing things. Because the way we say two things, the way we talk is quite different. And what you also give advantage at times to the children, their rights and things like that, you say children's rights, it may not be like that in the African context. So what do you feel about your people living and going to do same studies in our countries? Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's going to promote the cultural diplomacy and encourage the fusion of cultures? Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a student from Nigeria and one from Kenya right now. And they, they are now struggling with the, uh, the challenge of whether or not they want to go back home. 
And this is the problem when we recruit international students is many of them don't want to return to their home countries. And I'll, I'll ask them why, and, and they'll say, well, I got a, I'm getting a great job offer in Washington or, or, or New York. And, and, I had, and, and sort of my retort is always, well, part of this journey for you was to return home. You've, you were very fortunate to, get, to, to be receiving a four-year degree from a private liberal arts college. You, you, I, I would su strongly suggest... And I, I hate to tell a student what to do, but to return home where the work is going to be most rewarded. And I think that when it comes to capacity, when students re do return to home to their home country, I always tell them, and what my colleagues tell them, is that the best you can do is to build institutions from the ground up. Uh, start or participate in a school. Um, uh, uh, volunteer as much as possible. You might not be rewarded financially for this, but if you think beyond the self, your country is going to benefit more. So just starting in local communities, doing what they can do um, in terms of um, building the types of what a scholar would call social capital at the local level. And it's not, this is not going to take place, in the, and the results are not going to be felt immediately. They're measured, the scale is long term. And so what, what I always try to tell the students is you get embedded in your local communities. Use the knowledge that you've, that you've learned and try to build institutions from the ground up lo locally. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's quite complex. I'm, I'm mm. suffering it now. <laughs> yeah, because I, I went back after 20 years. My children. This is mm. a, well. This is a very a high topic in anthropology. Mm. Uh, to motivate those who are coming back, especially to um, less economic mm. privileged uh, communities. So we really need to find creative ways to encourage them to find a purpose. Mm -hmm. in, my, in, my, in my whole experience bringing young people back to poor communities in Brazil from Europe and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. helping people to find a purpose despite the economic disadvantage of what they are doing or, or, or where they are is quite key. Yeah. So I think your answer is, is, is spot on. Build it from ground up and because it's quite hard. I've got a number of uh, cases in our organization where young people just they just get lost. Yeah. They get completely lost. In their families, they get disoriented, are frustrated, they feel robbed, and they go back. And so there are a number of situations, but I think that what you said is quite key. Any final question? Oh, we have a number of them. Well, at least you guys are brief. We can I can do, I'll do my best, yeah. Or two and two, two and two. All right. uh, maybe ladies first again. Sir, my name is Komal Qureshi. I'm from Pakistan. I'm a freelance journalist as well as a student of business administration. Uh, my, I have to add two things. Uh, firstly, about mm -hmm. higher education. You s uh, I agree with you when you say that uh, the higher education in U.S. It's not just in the U.S. In, I think it's all over the world that people pay attention to higher education, but in my opinion, the primary education plays the most important role uh, because it provides the route uh, for your further education. Because in, uh, for me as well, I studied a good, good school, and I personally think if I had not attended that school, I would not have been able to go this far in my life. And on another note, when you say uh, uh, that the students, uh, international students, don't return to the home country and, uh, because they get a good job in, in the country abroad, uh, it's most of the time that uh, the students, uh, when, even if they would like, like to work in the home country, they are not uh, provided platforms or to work what they would like to work. So I think uh, what should be worked on is that a formal education to these uh, students and uh, should be given on how they can build institutions in their own country, like, and such platforms should be built 
where these students should be facilitated, you know, how they can work in their home countries. Like uh, even in Pakistan, there had been this human rights activist. She was shot dead last year, uh, if you know, uh, Miss Sabine Mahmood. Uh, she built up a very beautiful space, a uh, public space uh, for people to express their opinions and all. And it's called Peace Niche, um, t the second floor. So, but then again, she was shot dead by extremists in her own country. But people would like to work, but they are, they are uh, short of funding. They're short of, you know, uh, like-minded people. So I think the most important thing here is to uh, provide a platform where like-minded people from all the world uh, are, uh, you know, facilitated and how they can, it's a wonderful opinion of yours that people should build institutions uh, from scratch in the home country. But what are uh, the, the solutions to it? What are the uh, things that are provided to them? So that's my question. Yeah, it, it, it gets back to the whole idea of resources, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, which is, I, 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 I attended a lecture once with Joseph Nye at, at Harvard, and someone in the audience raised her hand, and she said, well, soft power seems to work if you can afford it. And that has stuck with me for a long time. So yeah, yes, uh, it, it's sort of like what what we call in the states a, a I guess a chicken or chicken and egg kind of scenario where you have this you can't one can't exist without without the other, right? And I, I don't have an answer for you. That's that's a very large comment I question. <laughs> I'm Michael Tetti. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I'm Michael Tete from Ghana. And um, I think I just want to compliment what um, the earlier lady said in terms of uh, higher education. Yeah, what I observe in Ghana as far as higher education is concerned is after school, it's very difficult for them to actually scale up in terms of skills and knowledge, what they have acquired. So I'm looking at a system or a structure whereby they can really, or our educational system can provide a platform for, let's say, a trimester work, whereby they can really get the concept right, rather than focusing on academic work. They come to the field, they cannot really do anything. That is one thing. And most of the issues also have to do with experience before work. So why don't we provide them with a platform where there is a, this uh, trimester work and like community services or community volunteerism, that will also be part of the academic way so that when they come out, it will be very easier for them to really, because you realize that there are a lot of schools, uh, sorry, lo a lot of graduates who have completed school and they cannot find a job because that practical oriented or orientation has not been yeah. maximized. That is one. Then two, as we talk about higher education, yes, um, the fundamental is the, or the core is the primary education. But then, when we look at the higher education and people who are deprived, people who are disadvantaged, they have the ability, the skills. What can we say as an academician? What can you say that should be the platform for those who are yearning for education or who have the passion for education, but yet still so their skills and knowledge is not enough to compete with those at that higher level? Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, great, great comments. There, there are, I was just reading an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education how colleges and universities around the world are re-examining how they organize their semesters now. What, what they're doing is they're looking at, um, instead of credits, they're looking at units, and they're also trying to move beyond, many of them are trying to move beyond their academic disciplines, which they believe are too narrow. So they're moving to competency-based education, skills-driven education, of which are intercultural competence, ethical decision-making, uh, diversity and inclusive excellence, writing, quantitative reasoning, all of these other kind of competency-based skills. But also, getting st uh, the research is showing that 
staying in a classroom for four years, three or four or five years is just, the students don't learn. Or when they do learn, they get to a point where they stop learning and they need to get out of their colleges. They need to study abroad more, collaborative undergraduate research with their professors, internships, those types of things. So it's learning outside the classroom that many colleges are now sort of investing in. So it's maybe not it's addition, maybe it's not additional material resources, but changing what you already do and reforming what you already do. Yeah. Thank you. Any two other comments, questions? Yeah. Yo, my name is Vincent. I'm from Nigeria. I study international and poly, uh, and diplomacy. Uh, my question is on uh, how is it possible for us to use a uh, soft power to achieve our national security, especially in a country where they are being faced with issue of uh, terrorism. I take my country as an example. A portion or a part of my country that is not a part of my country, these people are being faced with issue of terrorism. They call themselves Boko Haram. But uh, I could still remember that my previous uh, president, you know, set up a school for some less privileged students. In order, and these are the people that the terrorists use, I mean, recruit in order to perpetrate their activities. So my question is, how is it possible to use soft power to achieve, you know, a national security in a mm -hmm. social situation thank you I, I think when it's done effectively soft power we we resolve our conflicts peacefully uh, through through listening and through communication as opposed to war and terrorism um, those those coercive elements in diplomacy we, we have we have soft power diplomacy we have coercive diplomacy but I think that with soft power in particular education when it's done right when it's done effectively, uh, students who are the future policymakers of the world, future business leaders, they are the ones who sort of learn that conflicts can be resolved in a peaceful fashion. And um, once that's expanded and it cascades, then, then maybe there won't be such a, uh, a, a passionate maybe obsession with security. In, in, in its traditional sense. So I, I, while I think education is liberating, I also think that it has a capacity to promote peaceful conflict resolution. Well, I just had, I just had a, it's a, a comment about what our sister from Ghana said. Uh, I think, uh, Nigeria, sorry. Um, I feel like, uh, I think there is a lot of hypocrisy that is going around when it comes to education, higher education. Um, I think when we look at an example of Iran, when the US and UK engineered a coup and put someone like Salah in power, that end up becoming a dictator and then they're trying to resolve again the conflict with the kidnapping of uh, US citizens by the uh, rebels over there. So when we look at Africa, it's the same thing. If you destabilize regimes in most of those countries for political reasons, we look at Somalia, you look at Nigeria, uh, your country, you look at many other countries in Africa, they're all destabilized in a, in a sub-region. The geopolitics are really a game and uh, for oil, for resources, and for all those kind of reasons. And uh, my comment is, if they come here to the United States to study, but they cannot have a peaceful uh, opportunity in their home country, how are they going to go back for what? If they go home and then uh, the next day they get jailed for that, or uh, I mean, for anything they do, they have no opportunity, why should they go? Mm. Oh boy. <laughs> what does everyone else think? <laughs> uh, hmm, that's a big one. I this is not too philosophical, but um, I think one of the aims of higher education is that I think within each one of us human beings, there's a desire for, for changing things, mm -hmm. or transforming, or leaving a legacy of some sort. Um, and in, in those cases, I, I think there's got to be somehow those who will influence young, youngsters that they can be instruments of change. So we are a nation, individually. We are a people group, individually, as well as civically and ethnically. And I think that we, in higher education, we should be able to 
convey those concepts to individuals that they are game changers. I mean, I was in Lebanon last year in a small conference for refugees and I had to find words to encourage them. And game changer was what came to my heart and I said, look, if you, if you only can commit our life to change bit by bit, then you're building a new country of yours. You're building the future of our children. Which, I mean, this is utopic, but it's reality as well. There are you know, cases where this can happen. So I think that we should, in our institutions, should be able to be dream generators as such. So reality against some sort of utopia as well, mixed up together. They are not just machines of making money, of producing bureaucrats, but we need to inspire people to go to their grassroots communities back home to change things. I, I, I would hope when students do return to their home countries, their home nation states, that they become teachers. Well, I was going to say that as well because within our organization, what we taught a number of people in very poor communities is that those who know something know more than those who know nothing. They know nothing, yeah. And so, but. I just want to say something. I think you're right, but I've seen an example in Burundi, in Cameroon, and many other African countries where they got home, they became teachers, and they were all killed by the government, if not jailed, for the simple reason that they have to say things that are right, but that the government does not want. And you don't want the West to tell those countries that we don't agree with you, but when they don't serve the interests of the West, then it turns against them again. That's just what yes, I think. Going back to one of the comments as well, I think there is a role in those who have been exposed to more experiences in different countries to try to bridge um, the dream and try and, and make them fit back in their own realities. That's also the case of their refugees. They cannot go back you know, to their countries and say whatever they want or operate in the way they, we operate in the West. There's got to be mechanisms and that goes back to education, whereby there is a bridge between the two realities. Because we cannot train, we, I think it's wrong to train people to become just suicidal, which is the reality in a lot, a lot of cases. People, because they, they are not going to be able to operate there as they do here. Yes, this is a reality. So there's got to be mechanisms or subjects where in practice, we train people to operate the same values, but back in their reality. And you know, going back to the journalists, uh, you know, up there, it's, it's the same thing. Otherwise, they're just going to be, they're just going to suicide or kill themselves in in, in how they operate. Now, there are no no easy answers. I'm not saying this is easy. This is very complex. But I think it's possible. Um. No, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, we do have to conclude. We're running a little bit of time. If you could please join us, express our sincere gratitude.